How's everybody doing? Who needs a seventh inning stretch? Stand up. <laughs> do your little twist, do a couple of knee bends. Can wiggle around a little bit. Do your wrist thingies. All the stuff they tell you to do in the airplane so that you don't get thrombosis. All right? Feeling good? OK. As you're sitting down, I'm going to ask everyone, this is kind of the, the opposite of, of Sarah from Facebook earlier. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone to uh, please put away your phone. Like, not just in your lap, but put it away. I can tell you, if you want to be the scorn of student evaluations, be the professor that tells students <laughs> to put away their digital devices, their computers, their iPads in your classroom. Just watch what happens to your course evaluations. <laughs> I know this from experience. Uh, as I have a former student alum uh, at a moment here today, he can attest. Uh, so how are you doing in terms of, are you feeling a little anxious? <laughs> can I run a reach for it? <laughs> Starting to get fidgety? And you're thinking, so how am I supposed to tweet if I don't have my phone? How am I supposed to take notes if I don't have my phone? How am I supposed to interact and be on social media if you told me to put the thing away? And yet, this is exactly what we ask of our audiences, right? So go ahead and pick them up if you want to pick them up. <laughs> but this drives the title of what I'm going to talk with you about today, and it's called Overcoming Digital Device Separation Anxiety, or what I'm thinking of as DDSA. <laughs> now, DDSA is not about having your audiences overcome DDSA. It's about your organizations overcoming the insistence that digital doesn't have a place in how and where we consume. It's getting us to lower the cost to individuals of engaging with our organizations by allowing activity in a digital space, in our houses, and how we distribute. And I say this because uh, you see SMU Data Arts National Center for Arts Research. I will share with you some of you, or any of your organizations here participating in the CDP, Cultural Data Profile, a couple. How many of you actually hate me because you have to fill out the, a hand went up, okay. <laughs> National Center for Arts Research used to just analyze data and do reports on it, and now we have merged with Data Arts, hence the new name. We have been married for two months now, and uh, in the two months, we're, we're, it's going great. We're still trying to figure out things like who uses a bathroom first, and, you know, but, but we're getting there. It's a good marriage. But something that we know from looking at the data, we know that arts and culture in the United States right now are facing headwinds. And you could say, well, arts and culture have always been facing headwinds. But the particular headwinds that we're facing now are linked to several phenomena, one being the change in uh, tax laws that say that there's going to be a difference in how people can account for charitable contributions. And we don't know yet what the impact is going to be. So there's environmental uncertainty. There is a constant threat of elimination of the NEA, of federal arts funding and uh, NEH. We know that there's a shift in consumer demand. All of us as consumers in our daily lives, we are much more accustomed now to consuming in a digital space on demand 
And yet we know that half of the organizations in the country, a little over half, 55% of them, have tighter working capital now than they did five years ago. Is this an experience for some of your organizations? You feel that kind of cash flow crunch? And we know that over the fast, last five years, half of the arts and cultural sectors have seen a decline in attendance. So arming arts and cultural leaders with more knowledge, more facts, is crucial. But equally crucial is an understanding of what kind of radical shifts do we need in terms of how we provide our missions so that we become stable long term, but also so that we remain relevant long term. So overcoming digital device separation anxiety. This is one of my, my favorite quotes from a firm called Maslansky and Partners. And it says, we now live in an age with multiple truths, but only one truth matters, and that's their truth. In order to break through and connect with your target, you must communicate to their truth, not your truth. So what does that mean? It means providing experiences on their terms, not just your terms. It means speaking in a language that they understand. It means explaining not only why what you do, you do what you do, but why is it important to them? What is the meaning of it to people's lives? And it also means that you have to understand what drives behavior, right? How am I gonna know what their truth is? I have to get to the, the, the heart of that. And so I'm a professor. And so I'm going to show a model because this, this really helps to elucidate this framework of the thinking. This is a truth for basically any marketplace, right? So over here, we have our offerings. We have our competitors' offerings. And we have customer needs. What do we look at when we look at you know, the, the P, the points of parity? We're looking at what are the necessary conditions of anyone operating in this market to basically remain competitive. It's a thing that we do, our competitors do, and that people love and want. We see what their points of difference are over in area C. We see what our points of difference are in A. So what is F? unnecessary stuff that we offer that doesn't meet anyone's needs. <laughs> Just like over here in E, our competitors do that too. I'm sure this doesn't happen in your organizations. <laughs> what about D? It's all this stuff that you do because your competitors are doing it, and you feel like you have to do it because they're doing it, but no one really cares. <laughs> it's not providing value to anybody. And yet we do it anyhow. What is G? Unmet needs, right? It's the land of opportunity. So when I think about what it is that we offer, I'm thinking about how can I still stay on mission with our work, but then how do I understand what's going on in the space of consumer needs? What else do those people do in their daily lives that I need to understand and figure out how to connect with in order to do what I do and for them to remain engaged with me? I want to think about, you know, to act or not to act, that decision is driven by a calculus of benefits and costs. So when I think about what drives behavior, you know, for consumers, we all do this. You know, we think about, well, gee, do I, do I want to go to see that concert tonight? What is my perceived benefit of it? Is it kind of music that I like? But I'm also thinking constantly about the costs. So how long is it going to take to get there? I'm thinking about how hard is it going to be to park. I'm just not thinking about price. I'm thinking about all of the perceived barriers and costs to engage. 
my job, you know, I think if I think of the big M of marketing, the mission, our promise to our communities, that promise is about providing benefits, a bundle of benefits that exceeds costs. And so when I think about those needs, the problem with G is that not everybody has the same needs, right? I could just be shooting in the dark because it's so varied. So as marketers, we look at segments. So what is the bundle of benefits that meets some segment of the population's need? And how can I create programming that's going to hit in a way that's going to meet different needs? It requires leaping into this area G, my land of opportunity, to look and understand and adapt not only how I take of my offerings, so this is a big distinction. My offerings, my F, marketing isn't just about how can I keep pushing out my F onto customers. It has to be, am I willing to change what I put into that bundle of benefits and how I deliver it in order to meet needs? Do most of you in here feel empowered to change the product? No. Is there a sense that marketing and digital really kind of lives just off, you know, it's the thing that accommodates mission, but it's really not what the organization is in existence to do. So when we think about marketing, you know, oftentimes we're, we're thinking of marketing really just as, as, as promotion. What I want to think about is the larger marketing mix going back to basics. And the larger marketing mix is price. We're not really here to talk about price. But much of digital lives within the realm of promotion. We've been talking about that for the, since I got here this morning. I know it was you know, spoken about yesterday. The two Ps that I want to focus on today are product, the whole entire user experience as my product, the thing we offer, not just the art, but the entire experience. And I want to talk about that, that Rodney Dangerfield of marketing place. Do you even know who Rodney Dangerfield is? Is that an outdated reference? <laughs> Get no respect. So again, how do we have to adapt to what we offer and where we offer it to better meet customer needs? How do we speak to their truth? So thinking of a bigger M of marketing, how do we speak to their truth? So thinking about truth. This is a truth. I average 11 hours and six minutes per day on my digital device. Either give me a really compelling reason to leave my screen or meet me where I consume. These are findings from the Nielsen first quarter audience report for 2018. This wonderful figure of 11 hours, six minutes per day is up 19 minutes from the media gorging of Americans last year. And if you totaled it all up, it comes to a full 14, 24 hour days per month that we as Americans spend engaged with our screens. You know, think about your daily lives. This is probably you. Whether it be a phone, a tablet, a computer screen, engaged with, with radio. We are in a digital space most of the time. If they can't do this with you, they'll do it without you. And according to a Pew report, 77% of Americans own a smartphone. 55% on a tablet. And yet only 20% of people engage on a digital device within the experience of consuming art. There's a big divide there. You know, for the social media addicts amongst us, you know, this picks or it didn't happen mentality, the ability to share on social media, or it's a cost to me, has to be taken into account when we think about what kind of experience are we providing to people. The question is, how will arts leaders follow where the audience is leading? This is going to happen whether we like it or not. There's an apparently unstoppable movement to on-demand consumption. How does that fit 
with our traditional model of arts and culture, which says, come to the theater, come to the concert hall at 8 o'clock. Don't be later. You can't sit. Don't talk to your neighbor. Don't eat anything. Put down that cell phone. Shut up and enjoy it, because you can't get up and then come back in again. <laughs> and wasn't that a good experience? <laughs> And we also know that Americans have a, a, a shortened and shortened time, um, attention span. National Center for Bio, uh, Biotechnology Information you know, says that the average uh, American uh, attention span has gone from uh, 12 seconds in 2000 to 8.5 seconds by 2016 due to the influence of digital technology. So wh when we think about the experience that we're providing people, it better be pretty darn compelling or else I'm just going to stay behind my screen. So when I think about this and breaking it apart just a little bit, unpacking the idea behind it. Give me a compelling reason to leave my screen. Uh, so this is from a study that we did. Uh, we, one of our partners is TRG Arts. I'm sure some of you work with TRG. Uh, we have, in total, 24 million arts consumption households of theirs that we analyze. Um, this was a, a particular study where we looked at a market and aggregated up. So this is a pooled market study. And in this pooled market study, what we're seeing here is retention, conversion, and acquisition. And in total in the market, 66% of records were from subscribers who were renewing subscribers. 10% of subscribers were previously single ticket buyers at the organization who moved into subscription. 11% of them came from one of the other organizations within the market and then crossed over into the organization as a subscriber. 13% are new. Good news is 66%, so two thirds of subscribers were renewing from a previous season. On the other hand, when you look across the market at single ticket buyers, we see a different phenomenon. What we see is that there was some attrition. So subscribers who became single ticket buyers were 2%. Single ticket buyers from last year to this year were only 18%. 23% of single ticket buyers bought a single ticket at some other organization within the pool in that time period. A full 57% of them were new to the market as single ticket buyers. This was a four-year study. This means that on a regular basis, people came and they never came back anywhere. So not just at that organization. They didn't come back to any organization within the cohort. So what was it about the experience that they had with our organizations that made them say, you know what? I never need to do this again. <laughs> you know, Aubrey, uh, in the, the CI to I podcast that she had done with Eric, you know, talked about orchestras are excellent at securing new audiences. It's not a new audience problem, but a retention problem. That's where we fail. And we see this underscored when we look at the data across markets. Why is it that new people who come to our organizations have an experience that is sub-compelling? This is another finding that we've had from the data. One of the things that we examine when we look at reports is a metric that we just call um, response to marketing. And it's, it's marketing expenses per attendee. So basically, for every dollar, you know, how, how many dollars of marketing does it take to bring in each person? And we see that demand challenges are rising, particularly for some sectors. Uh, it's costing opera companies, orchestras, and art museums more in marketing to bring in every attendee. We know that for dance and for performing arts centers on average, it looks like for dance, you know, the, it's costing a little bit less to bring in any, every attendee. It's kind of a curious phenomenon there. What's going on is they are spending less and bringing in slightly less people. So that's not really a good 
metric, good metric for, for dance and for performing arts centers. On the other hand, we have theater companies and other museums that we see are actually spending less and bringing in more people. And I imagine that's because they are capacity interactive clients. That must be <laughs> what's going on. We could actually do a study, you know, looking at who the clients are and what is return <laughs> on marketing compared to the larger population. Um, that would be entirely possible. Uh, so when I look at it costing more and more to bring in every person, that's a demand challenge, right? And what is, you see as differences between demand, how much it costs to bring in every person for opera versus museums. What does that tell you about demand for these two different art forms? It's not saying that opera companies are uniquely inefficient at all. It's just saying if you're an opera company, know about what it takes to bring in every person relative to other opera companies, as opposed to very open, democratic, low-price forms of art like other museums and art museums that are easy. They have lots and lots of operating hours in order to consume. So their, their way of consuming is much more conducive to the kind of hyperlinked, free activity consumption patterns that people tend to engage with now. I want to think about this idea, kind of going back to the basics. Sometimes going back to the basics for me um, helps me to understand. It's, it's the fine grain of detail that elucidates the, the larger concepts. And so when I look at things like if it's costing more to bring in every person, is it because there is an access problem, or is it because there's a demand problem? And I'm going to kind of parse out these two a little bit differently. So this is just a, a wonderful model from RAND that talked about funders, policymakers. It's, it's basically looking at supply, access, and demand that influence the production of art, creating, performing, producing, displaying. And on the other side, we have demand. Individuals and organizations that are basically cultivating um, the capacity of individuals to have an engaging experience with art. And then there's access, the how those two things come together. When I think about access, access is really where customer cost lives. So my costs are higher if it's difficult to access or in the way something is delivered is not particularly palatable to me. And it used to be that when we talked about access in arts and culture, we used to think of it more in terms of like our, our outreach programs. You know, we're going to go into a low-income neighborhood and we're going to bust people in because they don't otherwise have access to engage with us. Or the prices are too high, we're going to lower the prices and that will give access. You know, those still count. But I also think about access in terms of how we deliver the thing we deliver. It's how the demand meets. So do we think that there's just less demand in the market? Or do we think that we have an access problem, that there's plenty of demand there, but how we provide what we provide is no longer part of that bundle of benefits that's meeting people's needs? And you look at findings like this from the NEA. This has been recently updated for some of the segments, but the figures haven't changed all that much from 2012. You can see that there is demand for arts and culture, but the higher consumption happens in the digital space. People want to consume it, but they want to consume it online, more so than in person. You look at visual performing arts attendance, um, performing arts making and sharing. You know, the, the, the attendance part is only about half of the population. This is looking at, at basically market penetration. Uh, versus arts consumption through electronic media, which is up there at 71%. This is a survey of public participation in the arts. So I look at this and I think there's not a demand problem. People are still looking for fulfilling the need of aesthetic consumption, of being uplifted, of listening to classical music or uh, engaging in, in opera, engaging in dance, but they want to do it online now instead of with us. That gives us an access problem.
So another finding, looking at a trend. Uh, here we have what is the reach of our community engagement considering in-person and virtual participation. This is the in-person part. And so this is saying, how many touch points does my organization have relative to my local community? What is our market penetration? And you can see over time, uh, art museums have reached a much higher proportion of the population. You go down to dance and to theater, it's much, much lower. In an in-person space, something that's really interesting to me, because this happened the last time we looked at this trend, was that it's pretty much flatlined. Market penetration has pretty much flatlined. The only difference here, only art museums fluctuated more than 1% over the period. But when you throw into this mix, not just in person, but digital engagement in, you know, digital uh, dissemination of programming, this isn't just talking about how many people are we getting to hit our website uh, or to like us on Facebook. This is how many people attended in a digital space. And here we see some significant differences. I believe that operas and orchestras lead the field in digital dissemination. Performing arts centers and dance have joined the party, which is really kind of exciting to see. But digital is the land of opportunity. You know, when you think about it, going back to mission, how many of us have a mission that says our mission is to sell tickets? You know, our mission is to engage people with art. Should we be more open to kind of blowing up what is the roadmap for how we get to mission? I know that's kind of provocative, and some of you may be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but how are you ever going to get my uh, CEO or my artistic director to buy into that? And yet, when you look at what the headwinds are, we're going to have to follow the customers where they're leading, or we will become increasingly irrelevant. So thinking about blowing up digital so that it's not just a way to engage people with what we're already doing, but how do we change the way that we do what we do? For orchestras and opera, they engage far, far, far more people on average in a digital space than they do in person. In fact, like 92% for both of these sectors, 92% of the people who are engaged in these art forms are engaged in a digital space. They're engaged virtually, whereas only 8% of the people they engage are in person. Uh, you know, these are really, it's, it's essential to continue to provide the in-person experience. But when you just look at the facts, these are largely now digital art forms. Their relevance in society has become largely in a digital space in terms of overall number of people that are touched by these sectors. So some different examples of this. What does it really mean? Um, this is about streaming, you know, live webcast from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Do any of your organizations already live stream performances? Some? That's great. Do you live stream um, educational programming? Cool, great. So you guys are already ahead of the curb. You know, what we're looking at here is um, Gil Shaman and the Enigma. It, it's looking at digital streaming lowers actually two of the access barriers. Uh, one is, it, I don't have to put down my device. I'm actually in front of my device while I'm consuming it. So you've met me where I consume. It also lowers the barrier of location. So people don't have to come to you. Uh, you know, in another uh, research project we've looked at, this is what we had done with the, the CI to I um, blog post in advance of this gathering. You know, we're looking at what is the role of distance and you know, how much does it come into play in a consumer's decision of whether or not to attend your offerings. So you know, looking at live streaming, you can also look at it as how can I increase my value proposition through live streaming? You know, for VIPs with my organization, or for an additional fee, how can I add on cost to those who want additional information to be live streamed to them? Backstage interviews or interviews with a, a music director. 
Meet me where I consume. Does anyone know what this building is? Dallas Cowboys headquarters. Dallas, uh, Dallas Opera simulcast uh, it has simulcasts onto the headquarters. It's right next to the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Uh, broadcasts of opera. And it's really great because you know, here they're doing uh, Madame Butterfly. They've done Magic Food in the past. And you know, I've gone to them, and it's a wonderful opportunity for people to come with their kids, for them to buy popcorn, for them to be able to get up and walk around all while they're watching the opera. It's a much more uh, comfortable experience for people, particularly who've not been to an opera before, to consume. So you know, these are both looking at how can you disseminate, how can you uh, send out in a virtual space programming. But these, let's shift to thinking about how do people use digital when they're in your space? So how do you not make them put down the screen when they come to engage with you? This was from Laplaca Cohen's Culture Track 17. Top reasons why digital appeals in cultural activities. You get access to more detailed info that's coming to you. The activity is shareable digitally. I can get a deeper understanding of content, and just being able to have my digital device makes the activity feel new. So thinking, how can you as organizations continue while somebody's within your space to incorporate use of digital technology? I strongly encourage you, if you've not read the La Placa Cohen study, to download a copy of it, because it's great in that they show uh, preferences and motivations with digital by arts and cultural sector. So you can find a, a deeper dive of data there. Meet me where I consume. You know, here we're looking at Pacific Northwest Ballet and their podcasts. They do podcasts uh, with the education director where it's a live Q&A with audience members. Uh, you can do it coming into the theater or you can just listen to the broadcast, to the podcast on the way to the, um, to the auditorium uh, where you can get a little bit more information and, and education about what it is you're about to see and ask questions so it's interactive. Uh, this is Brooklyn Museum. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies has a, a, a program now where it is looking to fund digital expansion within arts and cultural organizations. Uh, have any of you been to the Brooklyn Muse Museum and engaged, have you engaged with this? Where you can take your digital device, ask questions, get information, share insights. You can stand in front of a painting and send a text about what your question is about the painting. And they have archaeologists, anthropologists, art historians, educators there on call live to respond to your questions. Isn't that really cool? You know, so what's the deal with this laptop? Uh, what makes this meta? I see a lot of canvas. Is this incomplete? You know, it's all the things that we're so used to now. Every time you've got a question and you're curious about something, you open your computer and get the answer. This is doing it in an expert way with someone who's knowledgeable about all of the paintings. Um, meet me where I consume. Their mobile survey, you know, almost all of the participants agreed that the mobile technology enhanced their experience at the museum. You know, nine out of 10 people said that it made it easier to access information, and they thought it was an exciting new way to learn. Lincoln Center, do we have anyone here from Lincoln Center? One, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Lincoln Center. Uh, I love this app. L download the Lincoln Center app from uh, ticketing to pre-ordering drinks. You know, this isn't saying that it's influencing the programming, but it, the product is the entire experience. So while they're there, they're able to interact with the phone to have a better experience. My favorite part of it was this view the queue. Don't spend an emission standing in line. Use the app to find the shortest restroom line at a glance. It's genius. It's genius. You know, as consumers, we're constantly looking for, you know, how do we get immediate knowledge about the things we want? You know, how many of you here are using cell phones to survey audiences while they're in the theater? You know, why wait a week afterwards when the, the experience is no longer fresh for people? You know, people are going to pull out their, have you ever seen this at an admission, somebody pulls out a cell phone? 
why not use that opportunity for them to be engaging with your organization? And this is a site, uh, I, I'm going to, to play it for you. It's Octavia. And it's a really fascinating way for people within a concert hall to be able to get into the head of the music director, of a conductor. This is Octava. Um, I'm fascinated to see how this will augment our audience's experience. So the, the idea behind it is, is uh, very straightforward and I think very intuitive. As the music is performed, slides appear, just giving some, some background information, some descriptive information, items of, uh, that, it, that will be of interest to our audience about what's happening in that moment. As a conductor, um, it's always important to have these things going on in my mind. So when I'm conducting a tone poem or a symphony, I will think towards certain moments. And if there's an image I need to have in mind, I do try to, to before I give a downbeat, have this image of the muddy, dark waters in my mind, and then of the swan um, drifting along on those waters. And that's precisely what the audience will be given in that moment. I love hearing the, uh, the musician's point of view. The nice thing is that in the best case scenario, which I believe this is, it's sort of got these slides as you go along, the, the audience will, will in a, it's actually in a beautifully unobtrusive fashion, they can just look down, they see a slide change, and they can say, ah, okay, the swan is drifting along the, the, the waters, and the tuanela is the hell of, of, of Finnish mythology. Little, little pointers which will help to underscore what's happening in the music. It so. added a dimension. I enjoyed hearing the musicians and how they interpreted the music and the various parts of it. Let me understand a little better just the uh, choreography, but the orchestration, just the way it was all put together. I enjoyed it quite a bit. So. You know, the, the, the moral of the story is really thinking in different ways about how can we come along for the digital ride in ways that aren't just talking to people in terms of what we're currently doing and how we want them to engage with us, but how can we engage with the way that people are consuming? You know, how can we think about what we offer in terms of increasing benefits. So what benefits would enhance the experience right now? Enough to tip the scales for prospective consumers. Consider what additional preferences might we meet for customers that would also help to advance mission. You know, comparing what we offer to what people may want from us in a digital space. And is there an opportunity for us to help to provide a more beneficial experience for them. And then I want to think about how can you reduce the DDSA in an authentic way that avoids distraction and it avoids uh, complexity. You know, consider what the non-monetary costs are for people to engage with you and how you could lower them by figuring out how to change how you provide access. Again, the, the title is how to overcome the digital device separation anxiety, and it's about understanding how, as organizations, we can overcome the insistence that people put down their digital devices in order to engage with us, in order to engage with the art. Uh, there is a, a really interesting article that just came out in this month's McKinsey Quarterly, and it's called A, a Digital Strategy, The Four Fights You Must Win. And it talks about that struggle in organizations of how do you start tipping the scales with digital? Because the biggest challenge that oftentimes we face is that top leadership says digital is important, but we're going to keep doing things the way we always did them. How can we help to educate? You know, to let go of that sense of ignorance before we become irrelevant or unsustainable. You know, think about within our own organizations, uh, you know, this idea of being able to do a capabilities audit with respect to digital. Does all of the digital capabilities reside only in the marketing department? Or does digital also, capabilities also reside in development, in artistic? 
Looking at culture, you know, how ready is the culture to adapt to digital provision of programming or acceptance of digital presence within a hall? It has to be, it's like data-driven culture. You know, it has to be both top-down and bottom-up. There has to be buy-in from top leadership and from people who are, are, are on the ground. If not, then all of the efforts are gonna be kind of on life support out there in Siberia, just waiting for frostbite to take it away. And then everybody will say, oh, we tried that digital thing once and it didn't work. You know, so looking at how can you shift culture and what kind of capabilities do you need to bring in from the outside? And then to the idea of A-B testing and pilot testing, you know, to gain confidence in top management in terms of rolling out a more pervasive digital strategy so that it goes beyond promotion and into product in place. You know, thinking about how can you make sure that along the way you're hitting the, uh, the, po the right points that need to be hit and that you're garnering those uh, case successes that are going to enable larger rollout and larger development. So we'll have a more robust future if we're able to take into account reality of consumers' preferences, their truths, and respond accordingly. I think there's still uncharted territory in that area G in the white space of consumers' needs that nobody's currently meeting of looking at how can we go beyond thinking about how do we push to the market the thing that we sell and instead really understand in a humble way how can we meet needs. You know, long term, organizations that are bold and can redraw what the roadmap is to mission fulfillment, I believe are the ones that are going to succeed. Uh, not doing so, uh, you can do so at your own risk, but I think that it imperils health. Our reality has changed. Uh, you guys in this room know that, but in order for it to get to another level of organizational buy-in, that's really going to take uh, a sense of how has the environment changed and how is digital, are we going to meet people where they're consuming currently? With that, I'm going to open it up uh, for questions and thank you for your participation and thank you to Eric for the invitation. Thank you. I am happy to answer questions if there are questions. Yes, here in the middle. About this or any other topic you would like. It's the end of the day. Let's just talk about what you feel like talking about. Thank you so much for your talk. I, um, I was thinking about the, the comment at the beginning. It's sort of your, this ordering idea about connecting to your, the, your truth's target or your target's truth as opposed to what, what you feel like your truth is. And yeah. we found, I think, like probably like a lot of people here, that you know, social media has been a great way to engage our community, engage our audience, have that direct patron um, experience. But I manage social media accounts in a re very red state, but we're still um, an organization with core values and a mission of inclusivity and access, mm -hmm. equity, diversity, inclusion, all those things. So I was wondering about your ideas of balancing, you know, wanting to meet people where they are, what they're bringing to the table, but also holding true when you, you do have an institutional mission and some core values that, that have to be protected and amplified at some point. Sure, um, so it, if I understand the question correctly, you know, there is sometimes a tension between what your mission is and the people perhaps you are currently engaging versus people that you would like to engage. Yeah, and I think, so I work at a theater, um, and there's been a lot of pushback recently about theater shouldn't be political, ah. uh, which is you know, problematic in, in its own way, but, and, oh, and this was, we were presenting Dracula also, so it wasn't like, this wasn't even a, a political show <laughs> in, in, in its theme. Uh, but yeah, so, so we've just seen that come up sort of more and more, mm -hmm. and I wanna be very sensitive to like the way some of our audiences are, are responding to us, but also uphold uh, you know, our core values in the face of the trolls. Sure. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it, it's difficult when there are pressures for you to be something you're not. You know, if you know, people are asking you, for you to be an advocacy organization and that's not part of mission, then we say, well, there are other advocacy organizations, let them do advocacy. We don't need to do everything that our competitors do. Somebody else is already doing really well in that space, but here's what we do. 
Uh, there are underserved parts of the population. There is no doubt that that's true. Uh, you know, I, I think so often about the mindset of what's wrong with those people, they're not coming. Instead of what's wrong with us, we're not providing a bundle of benefits that's attractive to those people. So if there's a, a, a strong desire to have you know, advocacy in a quiet way, be about engaging underserved communities uh, without shifting mission, then more power to you. Uh, you know, the sense of relevancy, and we keep seeing the arts consumer steady base diminish and diminish for a lot of sectors. You know, understanding the relevancy, you can say it's about advocacy. Advocacy for what? And if it's advocacy for being more inclusive of more parts of the population, um, I think you can make the strongest statement simply by leading with your actions in terms of who you target, who you attract. You know, I'll share with you one of the, um, one of the projects we're currently working on uh, as SMU Data Arts uh, is related to the distance research that we had done. And because we now understand what is propensity to purchase around an arts organization and what are the different factors that increase it or de decrease it, like socioeconomics, commute times, et cetera, uh, we've created a model and created a tool that we're pilot testing right now in, in Houston and in Dallas. And it's an audience development heat map. And you can go in and locate where your organization is, tell us what arts and cultural sector you're, you're in, what your budget size is, and what your average ticket price is. And then we locate you and show you within a 30 mile radius, what is the likelihood of purchase for every census track within 30 miles of you? But then we started thinking, you know, that is really wrong because it only tells, it tells everybody, hit the high socioeconomic neighborhoods. Uh, so we've gone in and now brought in through the Census Bureau data, showing you for every census track, also what's the socioeconomics and the demographics of every census track. So if your marketing goal is to reach a more culturally diverse audience, if your goal is to reach a younger audience, uh, if your goal you know, through an outreach program is to say we've got programming where we really want to reach low-income neighborhoods, where should we provide this programming? The map can provide you with all of that information. Uh, you know, the idea of having multiple marketing uh, objectives for different target audiences is, is necessary and it's key, but looking at how can we put in the hands of people leading the organizations the kind of market knowledge that will help them to advance that. I hope I've answered or addressed your question. Other questions, other thoughts? Over here. Yes. Um, can you help those of us who might deeply believe in the things that you're talking about, but have artistic leadership who, are, who do not respond to data? <laughs> some, <laughs> you're kidding, there are some people who don't respond to data out there? They, especially in artistic leadership. Um, just any, any ideas about how to enter a conversation about these really important topics when that's not a card that you can play successfully? Um, you know, so, so some suggestions. Uh, I usually go into those kind of conversations with data, with evidence, about environmental change. You know, if you know or know from staff meetings about what the organization's difficulties are currently, have there been declines in audience? Has it been costing more to bring in every person? Uh, what's going on in terms of the organization's bottom line, working capital? What kinds of internal headwinds is the organization facing? You know, ar artistically, we want to care about whether or not the great art that we're producing is actually reaching people. And so looking at, can we start redefining, given our mission, are there additional ways that we may deliver programming. And I'm not saying we you know, go in to advocate throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We're not going to provide live performances anymore. But what other opportunities out there might end up increasing our ability to reach people? You know, a, a good friend um, runs the Goodman Theater in Chicago. He said you know, when he first started out with strategic planning, he had a lot of difficulty getting an artistic director willing to engage in that conversation because you don't want to be hemmed in. We don't want to be hemmed in by data and what it may tell us. At the same time, if you can frame the conversation instead of what would make tomorrow better? 
How can we make tomorrow better? Let's start thinking about what the plan for that is. Because you know, the definition of madness, doing things the same way and expecting a different outcome, it, it takes an, not coming in to tell them what to do, but looking at how can we help to change that top level culture. And I wish there was a magic pill that I could just give each of you to give to your board chairs or to your CEOs to, to make that change, but it's a, a longer conversation and I understand and feel your pain. You know, I, I did an interview with American Theater Magazine um, a couple of weeks ago, and he said, well, why will artistic directors care about any of this? And I think, well, they don't have to make their decisions based on this data, based on these findings, but wouldn't you want to just take that into account as another uh, breadcrumb along the way of making decisions? It, it's not to say the tail should wag the dog, but shouldn't the dog have a tail? Oh. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, oh. So we don't have a problem actually with artistic leadership or, or even executive directors, but the biggest challenge we face is the unions, the three unions mm -hmm. that we work with. And I wondered with the partners that you're seeing that have done really good digital stuff with live streams, how did they manage that? Because the cost is just so huge for us. And we deal with three unions, Equity, mm -hmm. IATSE, and the Musicians Union. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it takes negotiating deals with unions that allow for the advancement of the digital distribution of work. It's not an, an, an easy thing, but you can, you know, there, there are usually the stipulations of what is the amount of time that can be digitally distributed. How can that be parsed out so that together it's giving a little bit of a, a whet of an appetite? Uh, you know, clearly it costs, it, there's a different economic model between recording and dissemination and, and simulcast live streaming than there is for doing live performance. You know, it's also a question of will the ultimate payoff be worth that investment of resources because it will cost in order to do it. Uh, you know, in dance we see some more examples of being able to stream rehearsals. So is there a different way for rehearsal time? Again, I think of that, it's somewhat promotion but it's also engaging people with the art and trying to give them an experience with the art. Yeah. It is very tough. And ultimately, it may be a downfall of our industries. You know, we would hate to see it come to that. But all of these things that shackle our feet to an old model uh, make it really difficult for us to be sustainable enough to pay the wages that will keep the unions uh, lucrative, lucrative enough for their membership to work in the industry. Are there any union reps here? <laughs> other thoughts, other questions? Well, you guys have been terrific, and I know this has been a, a, a long day. Thank you for staying alert for me at as the caboose on this wonderful train. Thank you. Thank you.